Okay, welcome to uh, week number 13. So, uh, reminder, homework eight is due tonight. There's a help video on that that we, could, uh, we can still talk about some of those problems. So, I figured the last 15 minutes or so of class, I'll reserve just for any homework eight questions. Homework nine is available. It's not due until a week from Wednesday by class time. So we'll see, uh, hopefully we'll get everything covered from uh, the material from homework nine, which deals with mostly chapter 28, but a, a couple of problems from chapter 25. Just the very end of chapter 25 starts talking about photons. So I didn't, I didn't talk about that at the time. We're gonna talk about that today because 28 is really about quantum physics and uh, photons. So that's the next chapter, chapter 28. We will skip though section the first section of 28, which deals with x-ray diffraction. Okay, so homework eight due tonight, homework nine, a week from Wednesday by class time. Uh, the reason is the third test is actually uh, next Wednesday. So we're obviously meeting here today in person. Wednesday we'll, we will not meet, I'll make a video. Um, next Monday we won't meet in person. It'll be one of those review videos again like we did last time, but we will meet in person a week from Wednesday on the 21st for the third test. Okay, so um, over the weekend I'll get a practice test up. You'll have a chance to look at it. I'll make a video going over it, uh, that sort of thing. Remember, if you ever need to, ever want to have a Zoom meeting, just send me an email, we can set that up. Okay, um, the in-person lab tomorrow are people with last names A through L and whoever else has made any um, arrangements. And we will meet in room 220 and, and do the uh, uh, geometric optics lab. Everybody else should be working on pivot and I think probably diffraction grading pivot. It's the one that's uh, up for you. Okay, so uh, third exam, same kind of format. It'll follow the practice test. The practice test is just a study guide. It's not, uh, not for points or anything like that. And then uh, for the third test, make your own formula sheet. A regular size eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, put whatever you want on there, just like the previous test. Okay, any uh, questions about any of this stuff? So let me kind of show you what the schedule looks like. So we're a week behind, we're not gonna be able to cover all the material. This week we're doing uh, quantum physics. Today is actually 12. So this is looking at, it's quantum physics, but it's le looking at light behaving like a particle, actually. So the, the third test is over uh, ray optics, you know, le lenses and mirrors, and then light behaving like a wave, wave optics. And then chapter 28 could be called sort of like uh, particle optics or something like that. It's not, a, it's not called that, but when it says quantum physics, it's looking at light behaving like a particle. So for all these three different situations, it just depends on what light is react or interacting with for different behaviors that come out. Okay, so as far as what homework to look at for the exam, I forgot to mention that. Homework seven, eight, and nine. That would be material to, to take a look at for the, uh, for the third test. Okay, this is actually the last week that we have a lab too. So next week is test week. So there's, uh, there's no lab during test week and then during dead week, there's no lab either. Okay, so eight labs all together and today, this week is wrapping it up. All right, very good. So after 28, we'll probably do a combination of 29 and 30 uh, the week after the test and then we do a review for the test. Okay, very good. All right, any questions on, on this? Say that again, sorry. Where did the time go? I don't know. It's some, maybe it's some kind of quantum <laughs> physics effect or something. I don't know. Yeah, it really does fly by, doesn't it? My theory or uh, hypothesis is, for me, like every day it seems like I'm working, so it makes it go by quicker, you know, like weekends, emails, grading stuff. Uh, a little bit every day makes it go by fast, I guess. Okay, good. So, um, Final exam, I'm not sure if the actual date of that is out yet. It'll be in person as well. So as soon as I can find that out, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, good. So yeah, the, just the last 
you know, like three regular, three weeks and then finals week. That's what we have, including this week. Okay, yes. All right, so let's take a look at this chapter then. So again, the reason that we kind of skipped around, we went from 18 to 17 to 28, is these are all about light, depending on what they're interacting with, different behaviors come out. That's the, the reason for this. So quantum physics, this is kind of the transition from uh, regular physics to modern physics, things since 1905. So the photon model of waves, as you can see, this is from uh, section 25.6. So going back to, to chapter 25, we talked about how to make uh, electromagnetic waves. Chapter 25 was really about induction, but also about electromagnetic waves. So if you remember back to chapter 25, we had changing electric fields producing magnetic fields, and then changing magnetic fields producing electric fields. That's what an electromagnetic wave actually is. So there's some kind of disturbance over here. Maybe it's a changing electric field, makes a changing magnetic field. And electric fields go out into space. So if you're standing here, and uh, the oscillations over here, you don't instantly measure that electric field here. It takes some time for that information to get to you. And that's what electromagnetic wave really is. So that's the reason why this is in chapter 25. It's kind of a transitional chapter in its own, right? So we have learned that light is a wave. Uh, many experiments convincingly lead to the surprising result that electromagnetic waves behave as particles sometimes. It just depends on what they're interacting with and really the energy of some of these different particles. Uh, photons, maybe you've heard of this word. If you're walking around in the sun today, you felt photons hitting you. That's the way I think about it on a nice sunny day. You can think about light as behaving like a particle. These are just different ways of thinking about it happening. This doesn't mean it's literally happening. It's a way of thinking about it and explaining the behavior. Okay, so in some circumstances, thinking of light as particles really helps us out. Here's an example of an experiment where this behavior might come out. These are uh, detectors here, and that's what's forming this, this picture. This is the light intensity. So lots of particles, not very many particles at all. So you might think that the picture was just, would just be sort of uh, dimmer, right? This compared to that, it would just be dimmer. But it really becomes uh, more like this, uh, splotchy or something. I don't even know what the word exactly would be. Uh, less particles, more particles. So this shows that it sometimes light behaves like a particle. This is not, not a whole bunch, this is a whole bunch. And you get the whole picture here. So that's what it means by intensity. More particles versus less light particles, put that in quotes. If it did not have uh, this particle-like behavior, you wouldn't get a picture like the top. You would just get a dimmer picture of this, right? It would just be uh, dimmer. You actually get a picture where parts are missing, where photons are not hitting detectors. Oops. Okay, so photon model. Uh, consists of three basic ideas. Electromagnetic waves consist of discrete massless units called photons, and a photon travels in a vacuum at the speed of light. So you might say, well, you just said it was a wave, then you said it was treated like a ray. It just depends on what it's interacting with. All these different behaviors come up. So they're all true, it just depends on what they're interacting with, how much energy they have. It's tempting to just try to figure out one way that it always behaves, but it really it depends on what it's interacting with. Okay, so each photon has a certain amount of energy. So the energy that the photon has is H times F. You'll see this constant H all over modern physics and quantum physics. This is called uh, Planck's constant. And then F is the frequency. Okay, so if you know the frequency, you can automatically calculate the energy because H is just a constant. H doesn't change. In SI units, it's 6.63 to the minus 34th joules times seconds. You might have seen this constant in, uh, in chemistry. Maybe not, but maybe you have. Okay, so one photon has HF of energy. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Okay, there's a non-SI unit for, uh, for Planck's constant, and we'll see that as well. 
Many times in modern physics, energies are measured in electron volts. Joule seconds, this is still the SI unit for Planck's constant, but there's an alternative uh, version of Planck's constant in electron volts. We'll see that in just a little bit. Okay, the superposition of a sufficiently large number of photons has the characteristic of a continuous electromagnetic wave. So if you have a whole bunch of these coming in, then it behaves more like a wave. It's when you have just discrete, uh, not as intense, you get more uh, particle-like behavior going on. We'll see that too today. So uh, depending on its energy, one photon can cause some uh, damage on the molecular level. So if the, the photon comes in, if it has enough energy or a high enough frequency, it could actually break uh, covalent bonds. You don't want to be exposed to a lot of ultraviolet radiation, say, in Denver or something like that. That just means you're getting hit with sunlight that has a lot of energy. Ultraviolet has more energy than just visible light. Okay, so you might have to take some precautions. Maybe put a thin film on yourself, right? To keep yourself from getting burned. Okay, so photon model will be used really to look at light behaving as, uh, as a particle these massless particles. Here's some uh, typical energies. So a single photon of light with wavelength 550 nanometers. So remember, uh, visible light many times, any kind of light really, nanometers are the units that we see, has about 2.3 eV of energy. So what is eV? This goes back to chapter, I believe, 12. One electron volt is 1.6 to the minus 19th joules. So that's the conversion factor between joules and electron volts. If you completely don't want to use electron volts, you're used to joules. If a problem is given in electron volts, you might have to convert it to joules. Or maybe you'll get comfortable with electron volts. Okay, 0.24 eV, breaking hydrogen bonds between mole uh, water molecules, energy released in metabolizing one molecule of ATP, 0.32, uh, breaking bonds in a water molecule, 4.7. This number you might have seen before from chemistry. Ionizing a hydrogen atom, 13.6 eV. So if you have hydrogen and you want to remove an electron, it takes 13.6 uh, eV of energy to do that. Okay, this chapter and the next chapter really we'll, we'll see that again, that number, 13.6. Anybody seen that number before? I'm just curious. Yeah, okay, maybe from chemistry. Good. So uh, this again, this is still from chapter 25. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, based on the uh, amount of energy that we have, or the wavelength, however you want to look at it, different kind of behaviors come out. So when the wavelength is really, really small, or the energy is really, really high, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, that's where you see particle-like behavior. Uh, wave-like behavior comes in here, infrared, microwave, FM radio. So remember when we actually saw this uh, wave-like behavior. It's when you try to squeeze a wave through a small hole. Um, th these wavelengths are big. These wavelengths are small, so they're already going to fit through a hole. Right? That's the way to think about it. The wavelength associated with these uh, different sort of rays is small already, so it's going to go through small openings. When you get down to here, like AM radio, FM uh, radio, TV, these are meter-sized um, wavelengths. So if it's going th through a small hole, you'll see that happen here. Okay, then there's kind of a transition where sometimes it behaves like a particle, sometimes like a wave. Okay, so the visible spectrum is just a small part of, of this overall spectrum. And then, of course, with the rainbow, you get, uh, you can remember it, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. In the UK, they remember it a whole different way. It's something about a prince and a queen or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> the royal family's involved with the uh, mnemonic in the UK for remembering this. I had a professor at Purdue who was from 
Scotland, so he had a whole different Roy G. Biv. This wasn't Roy G. Biv, it was something completely different. Royal something, I don't know. Okay, good. So uh, low energy all the way up to higher energy. Smaller wavelength means um, bigger frequency. Bigger frequency means bigger energy. Okay, good. So we got the energy and the wavelength. So don't forget what, how you can get frequency from this. So the speed of light is the frequency times the wavelength. So in that picture that you saw, we had the wavelength. How do you get the frequency from that? You just have to solve for the frequency. And then C is the speed of light. OK. So if you have the wavelength, you can figure out the frequency. And those are inversely related to each other, frequency and wavelength. OK, just a reminder of that. Okay, good. One thing I, after all my years on the Earth, I used to sometimes get confused with infrared or ultraviolet, which one goes first? You know, which side are they on? But this is red, so this is infrared. It's before you get to red. The visible spectrum up here is violet, so this is ultraviolet. It's more than violet. That's how you can remember it. Maybe you already knew that. I didn't know it until last year. I just, uh, it dawned on me like where, where this is coming from. So infrared is before you get to red, ultraviolet is right after violet, it's like superviolet, right? Ultraviolet. So as you can saw from that, the uh, electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves span a very wide range of energies and wavelengths and frequencies. Radio waves have wavelengths many meters big, as you saw from that table, low energy. Radio waves are best described by, by waves. They're big and they're going through smaller holes and wave-like behavior comes out. Gamma rays and X-rays have short wavelengths, uh, high energy, so you wouldn't expect them to be going through really small holes. So they behave more like a particle. And this is sort of the in-between part here. Photons depending on the situation, waves depending on the situation. Okay. So electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, independent of currents or charges, but you need currents and charges to produce them in the beginning. So you might have a, a dipole here. It's flipping around. It produces an electric field that keeps changing, makes a magnetic field. Out there somewhere, there's a, a wave. It had to originate from somewhere. So it originated from currents or charges flipping around. But then once you get out there, you don't have to have um, currents and charges anywhere near. That's what this first one is saying. So uh, radio waves, microwaves generally produced by the motion of charged particles through an antenna. So if you used your microwave, I don't think I've used, oh no, I did use mine today. It's an uh, electric field and a magnetic field that keep changing. The water in your food is, uh, you can think of it as a polar uh, molecule, a plus and a minus on one side, just because of the way it's built. So the uh, electric field and magnetic field because of a microwave keeps changing direction. Your, the water molecule keeps trying to line up with it and moves around just due to friction heats up your food. That's the idea with the microwave. Changing um, electric and magnetic field flipping water molecules around. Now the problem is if you put metal in there, metal has electrons. So you're gonna get the electrons in the metal to fly all around too, right? Don't put metal in a microwave for that reason. Okay. And this is the kind of the idea I was saying with uh, how, do you, how do you produce an electric field? Here's a dipole over here. If you notice, there's a plus and a minus, and now there's a minus and a plus. This has its own electric field. Now, if you flip it around, the electric field direction is going to flip around. So if I'm over here and this is going on, um, it takes me a while to, for that electric field to get here. That's what the wave actually is. The electric field part is making a magnetic field part and so on, and that's what the wave is when it gets here. That's kind of a synopsis of what I was just talking about. Okay. So here's the electric field part. We know from chapter 25 there's a magnetic field part. The electric field and magnetic field part perpendicular to each other, and the wave is traveling 
this direction. Okay. We saw that in, in chapter 25. Um, so I'll have to look up homework 8. There was just a couple of problems from the very end that dealt with this idea. This crossed electric field and magnetic field part. Um, here the magnetic field is coming out at you. So E, move your hand over to B. That's how we know the wave is traveling this way. Travels at the speed of light, that sort of thing. Okay, so C is the speed of light. So radio waves are detected by antennas. As you know, you probably have one in your car if you listen to the regular old radio. Uh, electric field of a vertical polarized radio wave drives a current up and down. So going back to the previous picture, if you want to get this electric field part and, and use it for something, you have an antenna over here. The electric field part goes up and down and you could read that information. Now the magnetic field part, remember how magnetic fields induce currents. They have to be through a loop. So if you have a radio or an old TV, you might have like a, an antenna that's a circle, kind of. Do you remember those? You might be too young. We always have to move ours around when I was a kid. There's a circular part. That's part that circular part is picking up the magnetic field. Because uh, to use a magnetic field, you have to have a current, a loop. The magnetic field goes in and out. Changing magnetic field induces a current that flows around. So the round antennas pick up the magnetic field part. The vertical antenna part picks up the electric field part. Okay, so that's kind of a synopsis of what I've said. So AM radio has lower frequency, longer wavelength, uh, 300 meters or something like that. The previous slide said the best antennas are one quarter of the uh, wavelength, so that's why they're saying 75 meters there. It just gives you the most efficiency. Okay, uh, instead an AM radio detector uses a coil of wire. Just like I was saying, magnetic field goes in and out induces a current and that's how you pick up that signal. Okay, so uh, uh, my wife goes upstairs, she brushes her teeth with an electric toothbrush that has an, a changing current. And uh, this always happens. I'm downstairs, our TV just has a regular antenna. I get the Chicago station, South Bend stations for free. You know, it's just broadcast TV. But my antenna is right above in the attic where she's brushing her teeth. So for like 20 seconds, the TV is all static because it's just picking up <laughs> brushing your teeth, uh, you know, every, every night. So. so my antenna is picking up her, uh, her oscillating, changing electric field that's originating in her mouth and going up to my antenna and then going back down to the TV. Okay, it's static, right? So different things will give you some static. Okay, so here's a little conceptual example. Vertical polarized AM radio wave uh, is traveling to the right. Okay, so there's the electric field part going up and down, magnetic field part going in and out. So how do you detect the uh, oscillating magnetic field part? So again, to use the magnetic field part, you have to have a loop. And then a changing magnetic field through a loop induces a current from Faraday's law. So if you wanted to pick up the magnetic field part, you have to have an antenna like this. And uh, here I'm actually capturing it. If I had it turned like this, I wouldn't get any of the magnetic field part. So you have to move it around to be able to get that. To capture the electric field part, I just use a regular antenna. Electric field part oscillates this way and I can pick up the signal that way. Okay. And that's a synopsis of what I've just said. So that coil is in the plane of the electric field part because it's capturing the magnetic field part. Okay, good. So why do you have to turn off your uh, electrical devices? Although I think this is becoming less and less prevalent because there's more shielding going on. But uh, airplane passengers are asked to turn off all portable electronics it says to see why, hold an AM radio near your computer and adjust the tuning as the computer performs basic operations. So open files, close files, um, do different things. When you do that, electronics in the computer 
are closing and opening different switches. There's changing electric and magnetic field parts inside your computer, and the AM radio will actually pick up those signals. Okay? You have to have it close enough that it could, could read that, but uh, it would actually work. You should try it out. So imagine what happens on a, an airplane with all the electronics going on. If people are on their phones and laptops or whatever, uh, opening and closing files, those signals can be picked up by the plane's electronics. And uh, yeah, don't want that to happen. Okay. So I kind of talked about this with uh, microwaves. So in materials with no free charges, electric fields of radio waves and microwaves can still interfere with matter by exerting torques. So this really works out well with the microwave. It's just the idea that you have a water molecule, as it says here. You have a changing electric field. You literally make the water move this way and this way and this way. And uh, just through friction, you, you heat up the food. So if there's not a lot of water in it, it's hard to heat food up, right? Okay, good. So again, that's a synopsis of what I've said. If you think about it, it's pretty miraculous, right? I mean, I think for myself, I probably use a microwave almost every day, or at least five out of seven days. Uh, and it really relies on this idea of changing electric and magnetic fields, taking water molecules and flipping them around. So it's, it's it works out well. When I was a kid, I remember in like uh, seventh grade, they brought in this new device, like this is going to change everything. And it was this giant microwave and they used to be like $1,200 or something like that. It's probably not nearly as powerful as like a $50 one that you can get these days. Okay. Okay, good. So oscillating charges in an antenna produce radio waves. Uh, if you want to get higher energy, you have to have actual individual atoms uh, oscillating to get different frequencies. And we'll see how that works out later in this chapter with uh, atomic physics, really the next chapter. Okay, so that was just a little bit with chapter 25, kind of a transition into chapter 28. Anybody guess what these, uh, this is? This is a... Um, electron microscope taking a picture of somebody's rods and cones in their eye. So these are the rods and cones. So you need an electron microscope to be able to do that. And it comes down to this idea of quantization of energy. Okay. This chapter, if you get a chance, to, hopefully you have a chance to read it, the author did a really good job on chapter 28. There's, uh, if you go to the e-text, go through chapter 28, there's several embedded videos, things like that, that, that are really good. So. So to supplement what you're hearing from me, you know, make sure you read the chapter and check out the, the guy's videos. You don't have to go to the study area to get his videos. A lot of them in this chapter are just built right into the to the e-text. So here's uh, an inter interference pattern made by very low intensity of light uh, that hits the screen in these little chunks called photons. So again, the end of 25 is when they first mentioned photons. Here we're seeing it again in chapter 28. So sometimes light behaves like a wave, sometimes like a particle. Okay. This is actually made by uh, electrons diffracting from aluminum. So sometimes particles behave like waves. If you send an electron through a small hole, it actually behaves like a wave would too. This duality idea. Okay, so we'll talk about that later in the chapter as well. So the photoelectric effect is a really uh, nice way of thinking about light behaving like a particle. This is actually what um, Einstein won the Nobel Prize for in 1921, I think. So he was working on this around 1905. Oh, so 21, this is maybe the 100th anniversary. We'll have to check into that date, actually. I remember when it was 2005 and everybody was celebrating the 100 years of physics or whatever since 1905, but now it's like 116 years ago. Okay, anyway, so the photoelectric effect, Einstein did a lot of work on it. This is what he got the Nobel Prize for. And it's, it's this idea. 
Maybe you've actually benefited from this idea. Probably you have, and we'll, we'll see how that works out. If you shine light on an electroscope, this is what we talked about the first week of class, you um, can actually liberate some electrons. So you shine light here. See, it's all charged up. This is before the light is shining. You've charged up this electroscope. Electrons go to the leaves. It spreads out. You shine UV light on, so relatively energetic light. You actually eject electrons, and they go away. This is the idea behind the photoelectric effect. You shine light on here, the electrons can grab a hold of that energy, if the energy is high enough, and they're freed from the metal. Okay, so this works with, this is metal that has electrons. The electrons grab hold of, of the energy of the photons, and if the energy is high enough, they can leave. If it's not high enough, that's it. Uh, it has to be high enough or they can't be ejected. Okay, so you, you have to have light that has enough energy. This doesn't work for low energy. This, where, this is UV light, so you know it's starting to get up there in the spectrum. You can't shine radio waves on, on this and have it happen. Here's a way this, this experiment might actually work. There's a lot going on in the slide, actually. So here's a, here's a piece of metal. This is the cathode. It's metal, it has electrons. Here's the anode, and now there's a battery set up here. This is the negative side of the battery, attached to this side. Here's the positive side, attached there. Now, if no light were going in, you would get no current because these are not connected. So even though there's a battery source, these are not connected, no light, no current. Now, if you shine some light in there and it has a high enough frequency, the electrons in this metal grab a hold of the energy and they're freed. Now you have an electric field set up here. The electric field actually goes from this side to this side, but these are negative charges, so they move this way, and you can get a current going. If this battery weren't here, the electrons would be freed and slowly migrate over here, and you would get some current. This current is, is this uh, voltage source is just set up to set up an electric field that directs them across. And this actually works. This is the idea behind solar power, um, different things like that. Uh, light detectors. So how does a light detector work? Well, light comes in, hits a piece of metal, electrons are freed, and you measure a current here. And then you know, ah, oh, there must be light because you have a current going on. This is the idea, and there's so much technology that's based on this idea. Now, if you have a... Here's how I use it, actually. We have a light at our house that comes on at dusk and then it goes off at dawn. And it's working on this idea. It didn't cost much, like $10 or something like that, to use Einstein's brilliant idea. Okay, so UV light, so it has enough frequency, uh, shines on the cathode. A steady counterclockwise current passes through the ammeter. So remember, this is conventional current they're talking about. Conventional current means positive charges moving this way. That's the same thing as negative charges moving that way, though. So charges are actually, electrons are actually moving clockwise. So if you read through this and it says counterclockwise, they're pretending like it's positive charges going counterclockwise, when really it's negative charges going clockwise. OK. So light comes in, electrons grab a hold of that energy, they're freed, the electric field directs them across, and you get a nice steady current. Now if the frequency of the light is not big enough, you don't get any, uh, any current at all. This light has to have enough energy to free these electrons, to liberate them from the metal. Okay. So again, the Battery's just there to set up an electric field to help things out, direct the uh, freed electrons across. Okay, so we can take a look and see what happens with uh, a few different things. How much energy do these electrons actually have? Is there a way to stop this from happening? And what would be the use of that? There is a way to stop this from happening. If you take the battery and flip it around, the electrons are trying to come across. If this is negative now, you can stop them. Something called the stopping potential. And we'll see, what's the use of that? Well, you can figure out the maximum kinetic energy that the electrons actually would have had by, by doing that. 
this is one of the, the labs that we won't get a chance to do because you know we've been rotating through three different groups. We actually do a nice photoelectric effect experiment here. Wow. If we had three sections instead of one, we could you know do another one, but but we don't. M much of this modern physics stuff, uh, I tell you it, and it seems like magic. And like, why would you even believe any of this? Because it's so kind of magical, right? It's, there's no intuition for this at all. But trust me, this actually works, and we we utilize it. So the current is directly proportional to the intensity. So the current that you produce is proportional to the intensity. So if you double the intensity, you could double the current. The, the uh, thing is, though, you have to have enough energy in the incoming photons for this to actually happen, uh, this threshold frequency. So minimum frequency, that just liberates them. Anything higher than this threshold frequency, not only do you liberate them, but you give them more energy to move across. They move across faster. Uh, the value of the threshold frequency depends on whatever type of metal. Different metals have different uh, called work functions and cutoff frequencies. So you can actually tell what the metal is by measuring this cutoff frequency. Aluminum versus uh, different materials. Well, well, there's a table coming up. If the potential difference, the normal setup is one volt or above, you don't really substantially increase the current very much. So that voltage is set up to direct them across. Around one volt or so, that's where it kind of maxes out. You don't get any more. The current's just how many you've liberated to begin with. On the other hand, if you flip that battery around, you can measure where the current is zero. You've stopped them all from coming across. And we're going to see what's the use of this. It'll tell you the maximum kinetic energy that uh, the electrons would have had. Because you've taken um, that kinetic energy and turned it into electrical potential energy when this happens. Okay, there's a nice graph that illustrates number six here. It doesn't matter if the light is weak, although weak but still strong enough to liberate electrons or intense, the stopping potential is the same. Okay, so graphically we'll see that. Okay, so you get no current, no current, no current. If you, you hit the, freak, the cutoff frequency, then you get some kind of current. Okay, and then when the frequency gets even higher, the energy gets higher. The, uh, uh, freed electrons have more energy. Okay, so nothing, and then all of a sudden you get something. Okay, so this is for a given frequency. Here's what the current is. So even if you don't have a battery directing anything across, when the voltage is zero, you still measure some current. I mean, you free the electrons, they go in random directions, but some of them make it all the way across. When you set up a voltage to direct them across, oh, then the current increases. About one volt, you don't really get any more current. There's, you don't get any more current because there's, that doesn't mean that you've got more freed electrons. It just means this is where you saturate on being able to direct them across. Same thing here. More intense light, though, means you, you're sending in more photons you're liberating more electrons. That's why the current is bigger if the intensity is, uh, is greater. Okay. Now when you flip the battery around, both of these curves come back to here, to the stopping potential. That's where no current flows. You get absolutely no current there. Okay. Do you have the idea kind of in mind? Shine light in, free electrons, and then set up a battery to kind of collect them. That's the whole idea behind it. But the light that you're shining in has to have a high enough frequency for any of this to happen. Okay, good. So a minimum energy is needed to free an electron from the metal, to liberate it, I always say. Um, you give it enough energy, it can escape. If you even give it more than that, then it'll ha use that energy to have more kinetic energy. So the minimum energy is something called the work function. And the work function depends on what, what kind of metal you have. Some electrons require greater energy, or in other words, greater work function. So this E0, E0, it's pronounced, that's the work function. If you happen to read other books, some books call it W for work function. Some books have a, a phi for work function. It's the same thing. 
you have to at least get over the work function though. So you can tell what kind of metal you have based on the work function. Gold, it's hard to get electrons from gold relative to say potassium. Potassium 2.3 EV electrons or photons come in. You can free an electron from potassium with this much energy. Gold's all the way up here at 5.1. Aluminum 4.2. This is a fancy way of telling is something made out of gold or not, right? Measure the, the work function of a cathode made out of gold. That's maybe a sample of a bigger uh, piece. Measure the work function, see what, uh, what you have here. Okay, good. So another way of thinking about this in terms of chemistry is it's harder to, rem to remove a, an electron from gold than it is from potassium, okay? So uh, here's how to read this formula. This is kinetic energy. That K means kinetic energy. The kinetic energy that you have, that the electron has, is equal to the energy that the photon had when it came in, minus the work function. It's kind of like doing a counting. Here's how much you have left. How much was your paycheck? Well, your paycheck is how much energy the photon had when it first came in. Minus like the cost to leave. This is the cost to be liberated. Uh, that tells you the kinetic energy that you have left over. So let me write it like this actually. Okay, so the kinetic energy that you have is equal to the energy of the photon that's coming in. I'm going to write it like this. Minus the work function. The energy that the photon has is H times F, and then minus the, uh, the work function. So if they tell you uh, a photon's coming in with a certain frequency, what's the kinetic energy of the ejected electron? The kinetic energy is, is like your paycheck part, this, minus the work function. Another way of writing this is HC divided by the wavelength minus the work function. Because the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength, you can plug that in for the frequency. That's what I've done here. Okay? And then don't forget, H is just a constant. The speed of light is just a constant as well. Okay? Good. Okay, so um, I just wanted to give you my take on that. So in the experimental device here, you looked at before, the electrons after leaving move out in all different directions. So if there were no voltage to direct them across, you would still get a current. Setting up that potential difference directs them across. Okay, that's what it's saying here. If the voltage between the cathode and the anode is zero, there won't be an electric field, but you're still getting freed electrons, and some of them will make it here. Some of them will go in all different directions, but some of them will actually hit here. The point of putting in a voltage source across here is to capture them and direct them across. Okay, good. Yeah, as you can see in this picture, that's what's going on here. Ah, so pretty cool, even though there's no wire here, shine light, free electrons, and direct them across from one side to the next. Okay, great. So this is uh, the battery set up to direct them across. Because remember, this, this is the negative side of a battery. So this plate is negatively charged. This plate is positively charged. An electron over here, just from what we did in the first few weeks of class, doesn't want to be by this plate. It wants to be over here, so it'll go across. Okay. Now if you flip the battery around, you make this side negative, and then this side positive because it's connected to that plate. Electrons are freed, ah, but they don't want to leave here because it's positively charged. You could actually stop them from going across. And again, why do you want to stop them? We'll see why. It's really to measure how much kinetic energy they have. Okay. A lot of what we're talking about today is really stuff that we did in the first 
you know, three or four weeks or something like that. So, this should be familiar to you. The change in uh, electrical potential energy is equal to minus Q times delta V. That was with the chapter 24 that we looked at. This part is from physics 220. The change in electrical potential energy, or more generally, the change in potential energy is minus the change in kinetic energy. That's energy conservation. Okay, so we're taking kinetic energy, turning it into electrical potential energy. When uh, delta V is equal to this V stop, that's when all the energy that was kinetic becomes electrical potential. That's what's going on here. Another way of looking at this one is, is this. So the kinetic energy max is turned into electrical potential energy, which is Q times V stop. But the Q that we have here is, it's an electron. So that's why you see uh, E times V stop. It's just a specific name for the charge. So then finally, the stopping potential is, I'll write it the same way they did, maximum kinetic energy divided by the, by the charge here. Okay. All right, good. So uh, here's some explanations from Einstein. Why do electrons leave the metal at all? Uh, people were tried to figure this out, right? This is uh, over 100 years ago. Some people thought maybe it's just when you heat it up. Uh, maybe you heat up the metal and the electrons leave for some reason for that reason. Uh, the problem with this idea was electrons began to leave as soon as light hit the metal. Not that the temperature had changed, just when light hit it. So it, it didn't really depend on, it couldn't depend on temperature because it hadn't even had a chance to warm up. I mean, shining light on metal will heat it up, but these electrons started moving immediately before it actually heated up. So this, uh, this uh, hypothesis fell away. Also, there were some other problems. Strong intensity versus uh, at a different frequency should be able to heat the metal, yet nothing happened. So low frequency, but a lot of it still heated up the metal, but you didn't get anything until you had this uh, cutoff frequency met. And then there was a sharp increase once you hit that. So uh, heating it up didn't work. It's a good place to start, but it doesn't uh, explain the way it actually behaves. So Einstein uh, explained the photoelectric effect by looking at the work of uh, Max Planck, Planck's constant, who started to come up with this idea that um, you could only have discrete amounts of energy, different packets of energy. So this is where um, quantum mechanics differs from what uh, the world that we know. So uh, in quantum mechanics, you could only have certain energies, multiples of HF, it turns out. So 0 HF, 2 HF, 3 HF. There's nothing in between HF and 2 HF. There's nothing between 2 HF and 3 HF. So other things he was working on, he had this idea. So then Einstein said, aha, so this must be the same thing here. Energy is quantized. There's only a certain amount. That's why it's called quantum mechanics. You only have certain amounts. If I go to the tech building, I could walk up the ramp. I could be at any height I want to, right? So I could have any gravitational potential energy. In the quantum mechanical world, there is no walking up the, uh, the gentle sloping path. You've got to go up the steps. You're either at this step, or you're at this step, or the next step. You can't take the, uh, the hill up. You can only take steps up. That's why in quantum mechanics, there's only certain amounts here. So electrons can only grab onto certain amounts of energy. They can't keep grabbing on small amounts. Like, say there's a low energy photon that comes in. It can't grab that and wait for another low energy. Grab that, hold on to it, grab that, hold on to it, and add it all up. They either grab onto one that has enough energy or they don't. Okay, so again, here's Planck's constant, 6.63 to the 34th. Let me write it on our sheet that we have here. 6.63. You might have used this in chemistry. You can't see this yet, but you will in just a minute. Or if you want to use the EV version of it, 4.14 to 
the minus 15th EV times seconds. Okay, I just wrote it on a piece of paper. I'll show it to you in a minute. I just wrote this line. So how do you get from this to that? Well, you know that 1 EV is 1.6 to the minus 19th joules. You saw that earlier today. So you can convert joules to EV, electron volts. Okay, good. So Einstein suggested that electromagnetic radiation itself is quantized. So all this stuff, when it was beginning, they were just trying to describe how it worked. Nobody really knew what was going on yet, and completely people don't really know exactly what's going on. They observed what's going on, then you have to figure out why this is happening. And a lot of this quantum mechanics stuff, people really don't know why yet. There's lots of different mathematical um, processes and things that work. It works on describing the behavior, but fundamentally what's going on, a lot of this stuff people don't really know yet. Okay, good, so these quanta of light that have energy h times f. Higher frequency has uh, higher energy. Or if you want, you could write it as hc uh, divided by the wavelength. It's the same exact thing. Ah, and here's a shortcut. h times c is 1240 eV nanometers. So, uh, so what's the good of that? Let me uh, show you with this example, actually. Ultraviolet light, uh, 290 nanometers, does 250 times as much damage, uh, cellular damage, as equal intensity of light of 310 nanometers. Okay, because remember, the smaller the wavelength, the bigger the energy. So 250 nanometers wavelength, or sorry, 290 nanometers wavelength has more energy than 310. Smaller wavelength means higher energy. Okay, there's a clear threshold for 300 nanometers. What is the energy in EV of photons that have this amount of that wavelength? So it's worked out in the, in the slides for you. Let me show you the use of HC as 1240 EV nanometers. So the energy, hc divided by the wavelength, and hc will use this 1240 eV times nanometers. So if the wavelength here is 300 nanometers, as long as the wavelength is a given in nanometers, this is a really fast way of calculating the energy. The nanometers cancels out, and whatever this turns out to be. Uh, 4.14. So this is a fast way of not having to figure out the frequency, and then once you have the frequency, then use h times f. This is especially quick if the wavelength is given in nanometers, because you don't want to be multiplying h times c all day long, right? Why not just use h times c already built? So this is already h times c built, 1240 eV nanometers. If you do a lot of work with, uh, with this stuff, both in physics and, and chemistry, you would just use uh, HC as 1240 eV nanometers. And then it's just one step. Okay, so 4.14. See, in the, in the notes it was worked out like this. First get the frequency. Okay, that's perfectly good. That's this perfectly good, it just takes longer. Figure out the frequency, okay, because it's the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Okay, good. And then once you have the frequency, then you can figure out the energy. So, uh, remember, hertz is a one over seconds. And we're using the uh, EV version of, of Planck's constant. Put it all together, you get 4.14. So you get the same, same number. This is perfectly good. What I did was perfectly good. My way just was a little bit faster. Okay, any questions on either way, though? So the energy of a photon. All right, excellent. So the number seems reasonable. Going back to 25, 
the splitting of a bond and water molecule is about 4.7. We saw that actually, that number today. So uh, we expect photons with energies in this range to be able to damage complex organic molecules, right? Because it's 4.14 is relatively close to 4.7. Okay. Now when you start getting into really energetic particles, so like from the sun, the sun has a lot of magnetic activity going on. Um, protons are accelerated in the uh, solar atmosphere. They're accelerated all the way up to the millions of EV. So millions of EV could actually break apart. Say you had an oxygen molecule and uh, a proton is coming in with millions of EV. It could hit that uh, oxygen and break it into different, different things. So this is enough to break uh, uh, molecular bonds, but if you had MeV, you could actually rip molecules apart. Okay. All right, very good. So, uh, luckily, they may just scare you, hopefully, with the MeV ripping molecules apart, but this goes on in the upper atmosphere of the Earth, actually. You know, uh, depending on how active the sun is, these particles can reach the Earth hit oxygen, turn it into other things. So that, that's a way of telling how active the sun was. Go back and look at ice samples, see you know, the composition of different ice samples, because it's from year to year to year. But I was going to say, luckily, we have the Earth's uh, magnetic field to filter all this stuff out. Well, a lot of it out. OK. OK. So light has a uh, discrete certain uh, amounts of energy depends on the frequency or if you want you can do hc divided by the wavelength so uh, these photons are either absorbed or not absorbed you can't build up two or three of them to save them for later either you absorb it or you don't okay all the uh, all this energy just goes to one electron and then the electron is free it's like if somebody ran in here and gave me a bunch of energy and then i could I'm on the ground here, but then I end up on this table, so I'm freed from the ground, that sort of thing. Strange things happen in this quantum mechanical world. Okay, so uh, the photoelectric effect is a great way to think about, about this whole thing, about light just having individual quantized amounts of H times F. Okay, good. So an electron can escape from metal if it's energy. This is kind of a little synopsis. If you have enough energy that is bigger than the work function. So this is the photon energy. They call it energy that the electron will have, but I call it the photon energy. If it's bigger than the work function, then you could free uh, the electron. The cutoff frequency, this is the minimum frequency in other words. Minimum frequency, work function divided by uh, Planck's constant. Okay, good. If the frequency is less than the cutoff frequency, then you don't have any electrons leaving at all. You can't shine radio light, radio waves, and get this to happen. It has to have enough energy, UV usually and greater. Okay, weak light will give uh, fewer electrons um, sufficient energy to escape because the photons deliver all of its energy to just one electron. A neat thing, though, I think, is you increase the intensity of a given frequency, you get more just because there's more photons coming in and freeing the electrons. Okay, so all these things, all these observations support this Einstein's postulates. Okay, this is kind of a synopsis of the last thing I said. More intense light delivers a larger number of photons. Just because there's more photons coming in, there's more electrons being released and the current is larger, directly proportional. Okay. So uh, the maximum kinetic energy, I prefer to call this the energy that the photon has minus the work function. We saw this earlier. So the stopping potential comes from converting kinetic energy to electrical potential energy. Um, so you saw this before. This is the only thing to add, really. How much is the maximum kinetic energy? What's this thing? So you can take that and plug it into here. So this is really the last 
little equation. I'll add to our sheet here.